Hello, this is Dr. Martel, and uh, this lecture will be on Augustine's uh, On Free Choice of the Will, books two and three. Uh, first, a bit of review. Um, we know from last time that there are really two problems of evil uh, that philosophers have been concerned with. Um, one of them is uh, sometimes called the uh, uh, underachiever problem, and the other is called the uh, holiness problem. And uh, it, it may have looked uh, like the uh, holiness problem was solved by the end of book one of On Free Choice of the Will. Um, in book one of On Free Choice of the Will, Augustine um, distinguishes between two kinds of so-called evil and, of course, argues that um, one of these kinds uh, is not really evil at all, and that's evil suffered. He argues that this is uh, divine retribution for human wrongdoing. And so it's actually not evil, it's, it's, it's good because it's, it's justice. It's, it's God's justice, uh, ju just punishment for wrongdoing. Uh, he then tries to get clear on what it is to do wrong. And <clears throat> what, he, what he argues is that, um, and, and this is in keeping with Plato's view, um, uh, wrongdoing involves uh, acting on desires that are contrary to reason. And so this, this can sometimes, this can be called an inordinate desire. It's sort of a disorderly desire, uh, where, the, where the, uh, the order that's violated is an order that is um, rational. Okay. Uh, but um, Augustine um, incorporates uh, a notion that is, um, I, I think, foreign uh, to Plato's philosophy. And that's the notion of this power, uh, which, which he calls um, the will. And so uh, where tumos was the third part of the soul in Plato's scheme of things, uh, will is the third um, part that is at least relevant for his account of wrongdoing in, in Augustine's scheme of things. And uh, Will, Will uh, starts out as just like the power of doing things voluntarily. Okay. And, and so what he argues is that a wrongdoing is, is uh, a matter of willingly, sort of voluntarily uh, acting on inordinate desire. Uh, and... and uh, yeah, I mean, if that's what if that's what wrongdoing is, uh, it it looks like the holiness problem might might not really be um, like a, a problem at all, or or maybe I should put it this way: like there, it, it looks like it can be like solved um, uh, even on Christian on Christian assumptions. <clears throat> After all, uh, responsibility or accountability. Um, Sort of tracks voluntary action. Um, people are responsible for what they do voluntarily, right? Uh, and uh, it doesn't make much sense to say that um, anyone other than the agent who did the action voluntarily is responsible Right, so it, it's as though um, responsibility, uh, again, like it sort of tracks um, uh, voluntary action. It's those actions that we do voluntarily that we're responsible for. And um, if we're the ones who voluntarily did them, right, like we alone are responsible for them. It doesn't make sense to like sort of shift blame <laughs> to, to somebody else. Um, well, the holiness problem starts out with the claim that, like, God creates humans, and then it says, oh, yeah, you know, um, humans do wrong. And so the conclusion is, really, that, um, that, that God's a wrongdoer, right, and, then, and thus not, not holy. But um, already by the end of book one, um, we have an indication that, like, that, that doesn't make much sense, right? Like, um, uh, the, the, the jump 
from the claim that humans are wrongdoers to the conclusion that, that, that God is somehow thus a wrongdoer, right, is a, is a kind of like logical leap. It's, it's something that doesn't, that doesn't follow. Okay? And, and Augustine um, doesn't, doesn't get into uh, what the mistake in that argument might be. There's, there seems to be a logical leap. He doesn't get into what the mistake might be, but, but maybe the mistake is, is this, and that's that um, uh, being the cause of something is not the same as being the agent of it. Right? Um, being the cause of something is not being the same as the one who, who does it uh, in such a way that you can be held responsible for it. Right? So uh, to go back to an example that I gave last time, like there's a sense in which your grandparents are the cause of you. Right? Let's say you do wrong. Um, <laughs> there is some sense in which, right, whatever, whatever that action is that you did that's the wrongdoing, there's some sense in which, I mean, they're, 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 the, they're the cause of it. After all, they're, they're the cause of you, and it wouldn't have happened but for, for you. It's, it's your doing. It does not follow, though, that they, your grandparents, are the doers of that, um, that wrong thing that you so um, uh, being the cause of something uh, does not necessarily imply that you are the, the agent of it and thus can be held responsible for it. And if it's, a, if it's something wrong, uh, can be held to blame for it, right? And judged like less than holy. <sighs> Trouble is, <laughs> and, and this is sort of why like the, even at the end of book one, um, the holiness problem is still kind of, it's kind of a problem. The trouble is, um, uh, there are some important differences between uh, God and your grandparents, as great as your grandparents um, might have been. I mean, um, uh, your, your grandparents, while having been in some sense the cause of you, uh, don't also like sustain you in existence, like from moment to moment. And, and, and I think Augustine's God is supposed to actually to do that where all of us and everything that isn't God actually is, is concerned. So like uh, God's, God's um, uh, uh, sort of uh, creative work is, is not something that was sort of just done in like the distant mythic past, but um, insofar as creation is like bringing into being, right? God is in a sense, I think, like, like carrying on that kind of work like all the time. Uh, Second, and perhaps more important, and we'll come back to this when we talk about book three, um, your, your, your uh, grandparents uh, could not have had perfect foreknowledge, knowledge beforehand of everything that you would go on to do in life, including like the things that you do that are, that are wrong, but God is supposed to have this kind of perfect foreknowledge, right? Because God knows everything and is never surprised and never learns anything. Third, uh, Again, however great your grandparents are, they were not all powerful. <laughs> God is. So, so God is in a position not only to um, foresee what you're going to do, uh, including all the wrong things that you're going to do, but God can also prevent all of them. Um, if God is also um, like uh, ultimately responsible for the fact that you exist at all, right, and is sort of maintaining you in existence, um, then it if you add all these things together, uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult, actually becomes much more difficult to absolve God of um, all responsibility uh, for, for the wrongdoing, right? Uh, even though if you do wrong, you do it voluntarily and are thus uh, the, the agent of the wrongdoing and are responsible for it, it still looks like it makes some sense to um, hold God responsible too. After all, God knows this happening, knows that it will happen, uh, has the power to stop it, um, and uh, creates and sustains everything in existence that is involved in, in the wrongdoing. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Um, so the holiness problem at the end of um, book one remains a problem 
uh, even if Augustine has, de has um, uh, developed some resources, um, philosophical resources for solving it, and has said enough like to make us suspicious of the, the reasoning um, in the holiness problem, uh, moving as it does from the claim that, that humans are wrongdoers to the claim that, oh, well, then God is you know, an agent of evil uh, to some extent. Uh, the other problem, uh, the under tier problem, really wasn't addressed by Augustine like, at all in, um, in book one. I do, however, believe that Augustine was aware of that problem and I, I think it um, is something that he uh, does in fact address by way of considerations in book two. And so it's now to book two that I want to turn. So uh, book, book two uh, begins again with a question from the interlocutor in this dialogue of Odious. Uh, he asks, um, well, like, is it, is it a good thing that God gave us free will? After all, according to you, Augustine, um, free will is uh, the root of all evil. Um, both both the evil that's genuinely evil and the and the uh, so-called evil it's actually a, a divine retribution for human wrongdoing if only God had not given us uh, free will and again the will is supposed to be free insofar as like <clears throat> the will you, you can never you can never like, like uh, try to will and not will right uh, what you will is like completely within your power um, it seems like um, if, if, if this uh, power that we have is the root of all the evil is that, that there is, like, like the, world, the world would have been a better place if God had not given us this power. Um, and, and so, and, and this is why I said like the, the underachiever problem is probably something that Augustine was aware of. I mean, it seems like maybe the world could be a better place. Um, than it is. Uh, oh, and if the world could be a better place than it is, then it looks like God like is an underachiever. Um, after all, um, if, if the world uh, could be better but isn't, um, that means that either either God like is not like a perfectly good will. Is, is just not that interested in making things even better. Um, doesn't have the power. To bring about that better world, it's possible, but God somehow like can't make it happen. Um, like, or God like has the power to make the world even better, but just doesn't know how to how to how to employ that power um, to actually do so, or isn't aware isn't aware that um, the world as it stands is inferior right, to to an even better state of affairs. Uh, so. Uh, this, this question, right, um, is, is it good that God gave us his free will? Um, that question is, I think, like um, raising uh, to view this, this, this other problem uh, of evil, and that's the underachiever problem. So Augustine says, that, look, I mean, in, in order to answer that question, I have to first uh, address some other questions. And the questions I want to address are, um, does God exist, first? Second, do all good things come from God? And third, uh, is, is the free will among those good things? Right? And, and of course, Augustine is going to argue, yes, 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 there is a God. Um, all good things come from God, and the free will is among them. Okay? Um, and once we... Once we uh, Know that the answers to these questions are yes, and know why the answer, that's more importantly, why the question the answers uh, are to these questions are yes. Uh, we will be in a position to see that that is it is actually best that God gave us this this good thing, good will. So uh, as I mentioned last time, I I think that. Um, uh, what Augustine is doing when offering a kind of proof for God's existence is rather different from what later philosophers will will be um, trying to do when they offer uh, when they offer proofs. Uh, we're going to encounter um, another proof for God's existence when we get to the uh, philosophy of, of Descartes, 
Descartes really means to offer proof that um, any, any other reasonable being um, uh, would accept, right? So, so, so including people who are um, atheists, okay? Uh, Augustine's proof, I don't think should be, should be taken that way at all. Um, I, I think rather what Augustine is doing with that proof is he's trying to uh, lay out in argument form, um, uh, positions that he thinks Christians um, are already committed to, right? And and these positions um, uh, constitute uh, what what uh, I think I called last time a certain world of view, and and actually more particularly I think I characterized it as a certain metaphysical scheme. And that scheme is sometimes known as uh, the great chain of being. It's sometimes also known as the graduated cosmos because it's a scheme on which reality has levels to it, right? Um, some things are more real than others. And as sort of you like go up the levels, things get like, things get more and more real. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that scheme is gonna turn out to be historically very important. Um, Many philosophers and theologians and intellectuals generally working after Augustine uh, in the Middle Ages, they will, they will accept that scheme. Uh, and it's really only in, uh, I think, like the, the late Renaissance that that scheme is um, uh, de decisively rejected. Okay. Um, and actually, like a, like a good deal of the work that philosophers are, are going to do in the late Renaissance and early modern period has to do with like getting rid of that, right? this, this great chain of being. Okay. So uh, I'll first go through the argument and, and then uh, try and explain uh, how it, it sets forth this, this metaphysical scheme, uh, the great chain of being. So um, Augustine says, uh, look, uh, if, if there's anything superior to reason, then uh, either it's God or there's something even better than it, and that's God. Second claim, um, there is something superior to reason and that is number. Third claim, uh, God exists. As I said, it's a peculiar proof. Okay, first, let me, let me focus on this idea that um, uh, number is superior to, to reason. Right. Um, to Augustine's way of thinking, one thing is superior to another when the one thing um, uh, rules the other or uh, gives order to the other when the one thing um, like organizes, right, sort of like the affairs of the other. There's a relationship of superiority here. So uh, his view is that we can, we can find these um, relations of superiority uh, throughout the world. Okay, so if, if you look at, um, for instance, um, uh, like really any organic stuff, uh, plants in particular, and um, look at their relationship to stuff that's like inorganic, like water. And, and I, th I think as far as like Romans and Greeks knew, like soil, like dirt, okay? Um, it's, it's pretty clear that plants uh, order this inorganic stuff for their own ends, right? Uh, taking in nutrients, right? Um, th this inorganic stuff becomes, right, nutrient for the plant. Um, and and then growing, okay? So, so living things, plants in particular, um, they, they are superior to non-living things. Um, they order non-living stuff for their own purposes, for their own ends. So they, they, they in a sense, uh, rule um, over the uh, inorganic stuff. Animals uh, uh, clearly have a similar relationship with um, plants, right? 
um, using plants uh, like, like for their own ends uh, to to sustain themselves uh, to to sustain their own way of life. So there's this relationship of superiority between animal life and plant life. And then Augustine would want to say, and, and many of his contemporaries, especially intellectuals, would agree with him, there, there's a similar relationship between uh, rash, what he calls rational life and non-rational life. And so human beings, especially like in, a, in an agricultural, agriculturally based society like his, Human beings clearly, clearly um, dominate, right? Both both uh, non-rational animal life and plant life. Um, we we order, right? All of this other stuff, and, and of course, like we order inorganic stuff too, soil, waterways. Um, we we order this like like for our own ends, for our own um, purposes. So we like. We, we rule over it. And so we are superior to, to really all of that stuff. Right? And so what you can probably tell right now is I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of working up from a, a very low level to a next higher level to a next higher level, right? And, and levels, levels uh, are related to one another um, insofar as higher levels uh, dominate. They, they give the rule to, they order lower levels, right? So, so uh, like the, the, the plants like order like inorganic stuff, like animals, non-rational non life, uh, non-rational animals, they, they order like the plants and, and uh, I think probably also the soil and uh, waterways, water, and then rational life orders everything below that. So, uh, number, he says, that's superior, that's superior to reason. It's, it's superior to rational life. Well, well, how so? And the answer is that, according to Augustine, if, if, you, if you want to reason well um, con concerning um, concerning uh, numbers of things <laughs> in, in your environs, uh, you have to respect uh, laws pertaining to number. Um, numbers sort of have uh, an order amongst themselves and you have to, um, you have to calculate if you want to reach correct answers concerning numbers of things in your environs. You have to calculate in view of that order that obtains among the numbers themselves, right? So he he gives a trivial example of a of a of a, of a law per, pertaining to numbers. Um, I'll, I'll give another trivial example, um, like you know, uh, if you want <laughs> to 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 uh, uh, find out how many of of some of some kind of object you have among uh, in your environs, how many there are, and uh, like you you know that um, uh, it is uh, basically a number that's that's uh, obtained by by um, multiplying an odd by an odd. Right? Uh, whatever you come up with, it had better be odd, <laughs> uh, because that's that's a that's a that's a you know a kind of trivial law uh, having to do with the, the order that obtains among, among numbers. Um, an odd times an odd is always an odd, right? An odd multiple of an odd number of objects uh, is itself an odd number, okay? So, so the idea here is that, that reason itself, in, in its calculative activities. Uh, we ourselves, insofar as we calculate, we are, uh, in a sense, like dominated by number. Number gives the rule to us. Therefore,
for God exists. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so uh, okay, what he's done here is he's, he's um, let us know about another uh, level in this scheme of things, right? So at the bottom you have um, inorganic stuff, and then you have plants, and then you have non-rational uh, life, like, like non-rational animals, and then you have rational life, and then above that there is um, number. So and so God exists, and we, we know from that actually the first premise of this argument, so the very first statement made in the argument that provides evidence, uh, we know that if anything is superior to reason, then either um, it is God, or there's there's something even better than it, and it is God. And so this this argument leaves us with the conclusion that like actually at the, at the level that's above human beings, right number, right, uh, either that's God. Or God's on an even higher level, and and that's that's God. That's where God is at. And I, I believe it turns out to be the case that for Augustine, um, in a sense, uh, both those claims are true. That is that that God is number, and that God is something like even even greater, this superior to number, right? And that it, it is actually at the top of this of this scheme. So God would be like the most real being, even even more real than than number. Also, God's the most real being, so God actually is uh, superior to number, like somehow like dominates number, um, like like uh, uh, number depends upon upon God. Okay. I I think his view is actually that like like both both of those. God is number and God is even superior to number. Like, like how, how so? Um, the answer is that uh, Augustine's God is, is one. Okay? And this is, this is not just like a, the relatively uh, trivial claim um, in that part of the world at that time, that there's only one God. <laughs> um, I mean, there are people around who would have disagreed with that claim, like, like quite vigorously still, um, various um, sorts of like what the Christians call pagans. Um, but, you know, I mean, there were Jews too. Uh, they, they also worshipped only, only one God. So um, I, Augustine is not just saying uh, that there's only one God and not like, like many different gods. Um, I think what Augustine is saying instead is that like, like God is like a perfectly like unitary being. Like, like God doesn't even really have like parts uh, that uh, uh, that that can be like distinct can be distinguished from one another, or that like, could somehow like like exist apart from each other. Uh, God is a perfectly I guess in a, another way of putting it is God is like a perfectly like like uniform. Being, and I, and I suspect this is what Augustine is getting at, because that's actually that's a that's a fairly old idea in in Greek metaphysics. Like even philosophers before Plato, uh, like Xenophanes, right, and uh, possibly his student Parmenides, already had this notion right, that that what's ultimately real is one in the sense of being like perfectly like uniform right so so uh god is one right, in this sense okay well um what are the numbers now well, let's not try to answer this question in light of like contemporary um number theory let's let's think about the kind of numbers that augustine was familiar with i mean augustine's going to be familiar with like um i think what we now call um the rational numbers. So he's he's familiar with uh, what are they like the uh, positive integers, and he's familiar with like fractions, okay, po positive ones, right? Look, uh, the fractions, uh, all all of them can all all of them can be expressed right um, by by two whole numbers, one of which is the numerator and one of which is the denominator. Right? So like three and four, five and seven, you get the idea. Um, all those, all those uh, whole numbers, um, uh, 
They're all multiples of one. One. <laughs> um, and so uh, if you think about it this way, um, all, all of the numbers are constructed out of one. They're just, they're just multiples of um, unity. Right? And, so, and so all of them uh, depend for their being such that they have it on, on unity. And, and unity, oneness, is God. Okay. Well, if, if they all depend upon God, then God is certainly like superior to them. God sort of like dominates them. God like gives the rule, gives the rule to them. Um, and so and so God is right, superior to them. Although, right, in a sense, God is number insofar as God is um, one, right? like perfectly, perfectly unified. Uh, right. <clears throat> so, again, uh, this is a view of reality according to which it comes, like in levels. Right? And as you work up from the bottom to the top, things get more and more and more um, real. Right? Um, God is at the very top. Uh, and this, this scheme, again, has two names. Uh, probably the most straightforward name is the graduated cosmos, right? because there are grades to the world, the cosmos. Okay? Uh, and it's also known as uh, the great chain of being, I, I, I suppose because the levels are, are conceived of as like links of the chain all of which ultimately hang on right, um, the, the top link, uh, and that's God. They're, they're all contingent on um, the most real being, and that's, that's God. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so God exists. <laughs> the, the answer to our first question is yes. Uh, second question. Do all good things come from God? And the answer is yes, uh, for the following reasons. And, and this part, again, is going to be like a little bit difficult to understand. Uh, here goes. Look, um, ev everything that exists, according to Augustine, has to, has to have unity. It has to 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 be an, an example of of oneness, right? Um, uh, if it were not if it were not um, all together, if it were not um, like unified, then um, it would be of course like in a bunch of parts, and so we wouldn't talk about it existing at all, right? In in, in order for like a like a human human being to be right like our parts, if, if body and soul are two different things, then like they, they have to be together, they have to be unified. Um, and like our, our, our uh, the human body, if it's to be like a human body and not like the remains of a, of a human body, right? Um, the, the parts have to have to be unified. Right? They have to be like all together, like in a particular arrangement, in a particular organization. Right? Uh, this is, this is why Augustine in another work says that like, like all, all things and everyone seek peace um, because like, peace is a kind of unity and uh, unity is a condition of being. Um, and then he adds, and I, I sort of like this about, about human beings, he adds like, but the thing you have to understand is that while everyone wants peace, like, like they, they also want peace on their terms. <laughs> so so um, it's, it's a little bit misleading when some party to a uh, dispute that's about, about to become violent, right? They, they, they say, you know, I, I only want peace. I come in peace. Well, yeah, man, but you, like, you, you want it on, on your terms. Um, anyway, um, everything seeks peace because everything, everything that is, right, Augustine thinks like uh, seeks, in, in some sense, it's, it's, it seeks to be um, and, and being is a matter of, of unity. Peace brings unity. Okay. Um, well, if everything that is exists only insofar as it um, sort of exemplifies unity, 
then everything that exists to Augustine's way of thinking exists um, owing to uh, not just God, but God's um, unity. Right? So the, the relationship here between uh, the unity that is God, oneness, and anything that exists that is unified uh, is rather like the relationship between the form of justice in Plato's scheme of things and um, any, any particular just act or just person or just society. I mean, and Plato's view is that um, uh, it's, it's, in, it's, in, it's in virtue of right, uh, the form of justice that there, can, that there can be just people, just acts, just institutions, right? Um, it, 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 would, it, it, would, it would be impossible for, for something to, to be a just act or, or a just person if they did not exemplify justice. So, so justice is required in order for there to be um, instances of it, okay? Oneness, which is God, is required. If there are going to be things other than God, that are one and thus exist at all. <laughs> so, so I, I sometimes put it also this, this way to students. Um, uh, everything that exists in this scheme, uh, it is informed by God, right? Um, it exists owing to the fact that it exemplifies um, the creator, right? It exemplifies creator insofar as it has um, uh, unity, right? Uh, insofar as it is um, uh, uh, an example, an instance of, of the oneness that is God. Okay. Um, but do all good, but, but do, but do uh, all good things come from God? Uh, and that, that the answer is yes, because also, Augustine thinks uh, everything that comes from God is good. And of course, everything comes from God. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah, uh, all, all, all good thing, all good things come from God. Okay, like how, how does this uh, part of his um, scheme work? Well. Um, Augustine's view is, uh, as I've already indicated several times, like very, very similar to Plato's, um, Plato's views. Um, Plato also believed in something like a, a graduated cosmos. Right? Uh, his scheme differs in a number of, of details significantly, but he too thought that there were levels of reality, right? Like lowest levels of like images and then physical things and then uh, geometrical figures and numbers and above that. Forms, and you'll recall too from the allegory of the cave that, that there is a form that sort of stands out. It's different than all the other forms. And, and, and Plato does seem to, to say that, that the other forms somehow actually depend upon it. And that, that form in the allegory of the cave is represented by the sun. The, the sun stands for that form. And that form is the good. And so what, what Plato seems to want to say is that uh, everything that is in this whole scheme, on up to the forms, everything that is, is good, right? That it, that it is as all means it has to be good to some extent. This, this, everything ultimately uh, depends upon the good. Everything is... Uh, to some extent, informed by the good, if it is at all. Um, you can understand a lot about Augustine, I think, by like, like thinking of his God, the Christian God, <laughs> particular kind of Christianity, as, as, as occupying um, the place in, in his scheme that the good, or like the sun in the allegory, occupies in um, Plato's God is not just one. God is also like goodness itself. Right? I mean, 
indeed, since God is like perfectly uniform, actually, and this is a little bit of a stretch, but I, I, I suspect that it's a true account of his views, the oneness of God is, is actually not really different than um, the goodness of God. Like oneness and goodness are um, somehow like the same, like the same. And, and so what this means is that um, anything that exists, so far as it is unified and so far as it exemplifies the oneness of God, also exemplifies, um, is informed by the goodness that is God. And thus, everything that exists, right, is good. And of course, in this scheme, Everything besides God that exists comes from God. And so uh, Augustine's view is actually that like, the whole of creation is good. Everything that exists, right, is either God, which is goodness itself, or is informed by God, and in a way, like, exemplifies God. And so it's good, too. Uh, it follows, then, that um, uh, free will is also good. It has to be. After all, it exists. <laughs> and, and if it exists, it's informed by God. It, it um, exemplifies the goodness that is God. Right? And you might wonder, well, well, well how? Uh, and Augustine, I think, does tell us a bit about um, how, in particular, um, it, it, it has to do with the role that it, it is meant to play in um, this, this scheme of things. Um, it's because of the free will that there are very great goods in the world that would otherwise not exist. Um, after all, among the very best things that there are in this world are um, uh, righteous acts performed voluntarily. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, uh, flowers are nice. <laughs> like, um, like I have some, I have some geraniums, uh, like one sort of red and one sort of pink, and they, they just, for some reason, like they perpetually bloom. Like, uh, like all through the summer, they were going crazy. And last winter, um, they were still blooming, very strange. Anyway, I mean, they're, they're, they're quite lovely. Um, they're good. Um, but the, the idea here is like the, the goodness of, of, a, of, a, of a part of the world that has like nothing to do with will. It pales in comparison to what you might call like moral goodness, right? And, and moral goodness has to do with, with things that, that um, Beings with will do in the course of exercising their power to act voluntarily. Right? So, so um, uh, free will uh, in this world serves a, a great purpose. It makes this world a much better place than it otherwise would be because the free will is a condition of the possibility of these like morally good tax. Right? And so now we, now we understand both sort of like um, uh, abstractly and, and, and quite specifically how it is that the free will is a good thing. It's, it's, it's God was good, clearly, in, in giving humans uh, this good power. So, um, Evodius, uh, like, uh, like he, he, he eventually uh, res responds to this, um, responds to this argument as follows. I mean, he notes that, um, yeah, it does, it does seem like the cosmos is organized in this way. That's what we Christians uh, either think or should think if we thought clearly about these matters. Um, and it sure does seem like, you know, all good things come from God. And um, he's persuaded that yeah, I mean, like the, the free will is a, is a good thing. It's uh, it's it serves a good purpose. 
very, actually a very great purpose. Um, however, he, he notes that uh, it seems like it seems like God could have given us free will um, without thereby creating a world in which there's any uh, evil. And that would be better. <laughs> and again, this is this this is sort of raising this other problem of evil, that is what I call the, the underachiever problem. Um, because if it if if a better world than this one is possible, it does seem as though God has to be to be um, less than God is made out to be um, by Christians. Okay. So 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 Vodius notes, look, uh, it seems like God could have uh, given created humans with free will without thereby giving rise to a world that has any evil in it whatsoever. Um, so, so none of the, the evil that's not really evil, which is like divine retribution for human wrongdoing, and none of the wrongdoing either. I mean, after all, I mean, like, like, like couldn't God have created a world where there are um, human beings, maybe like different than the humans that actually inhabit this world, human beings that are like basically like kind of um, like angelic. Like maybe not like angels are I guess supposed to be like immortal. So maybe like still like 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 mortal or or, or otherwise limited in, in power vis-a-vis uh, -vis angels compared to angels. Uh, beings though who are angelic in the following sense. Um, they have this power to voluntarily act. They they could do wrong then if they chose. But as a matter of fact, they never choose to do so. Like, isn't that, isn't that like a like a possible, isn't that like a possible world? Um, isn't it within God's power to have created such a world? Um, and and isn't that like a better world? Right? I mean, if we answer these questions affirmatively, um, then 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 it seems like God must be uh, somehow like lacking because. Better world was a, a better world could have been made. Right. All right. Augustine uh, relies upon that great chain of being view in order to address this um, objection. And what he argues is the following: No. Um, actually, uh, a, a world that 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 lacked. Beings who are who are like us and, and occasionally like misuse misuse our free will by doing wrong, actually, that's the best world. That's that's better than um, uh, any other world that God could have created, including a world that that only has among the beings with free will, basically angels. <laughs> so beings that have the free will but like never misuse it. Never, never do wrong. Okay. Why? Well, look. Um, if 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 God is the being that Christians make God out to be, then then everything that God creates is good, and God misses no opportunity to bring about goodness. God, God. In other words, like if God has like you know, opportunities to create, and whatever God creates is good, then what God's going to do if Christians have God right is God's God's going to like basically uh, take every opportunity to create that God can, even if sometimes the creature is actually of quite limited goodness. Okay. That great chain of being view, that scheme, the graduated cosmos view, it has in it, right, a lot of different levels. And so in a way, right, that scheme, right, um, like, uh, includes like spaces in it for possible beings. If God, in creating this world, failed to fill up some of that space, God would have missed a creative opportunity and thus an opportunity to do good. 
come back to human beings. Are we angels? No. Could we be better? No. Right? But it seems like if God is going to fill up all the space available in this scheme, something's got to occupy a level like below, or sorry, right, uh, above non-rational animals and below, right, angelic beings. Uh, and these are going to be beings who uh, have free will and occasionally misuse it, right? So we're not like perfectly good. We're no angels, right? but insofar as we exist and have free will, we are good to some extent. So better that God exhausted creative opportunity in creating us and filling this niche in reality than if God had like left that space in the graduated cosmos empty. Um, that's the view. Uh, I believe he also considers like another objection from Avodius. Uh, book two is a pretty long book. And uh, the, the objection basically runs this way. Well, okay, so like God, God, is, God is exhausting right, all creative possibilities and creating beings of limited goodness such as ourselves, right? Beings who have free will and sometimes misuse it. Okay, like, I mean, let, let's say that that is in fact like, like um, better than a world in which there would like only be like dirt plants, animals, and angels. Okay. <laughs> um, because this world's full, right? Whereas that other world would be like, like comparatively empty. Creative opportunity would have been this. Okay. Granting all that, which is a lot. Does there have to be like as much wrongdoing like, <laughs> like, like as there is? I mean, I, uh, you know, in Augustine's day, um, like the people were aware of like a great, a great deal of wrongdoing, like both within like the remnants of the Western Roman Empire and, and without, I mean, I think I said in the last lecture and providing background for Augustine, the Western Roman Empire, I think it falls in like 472 and that's not terribly long after Augustine's death and it falls as a result of successive barbarian invasions and the barbarian invasions were not like, this was not a peaceful affair. This, this, this was, this was not like a, like a, a friendly match between sporting teams. I mean, this was like, like extremely violent. And some of the violence was downright like horrific, like very, very bad things were done in the course of these, these invasions and responses to them and resistance to them and so on. Um, does there have to be as much uh, evil doing in the world as there is, uh, even if we grant that um, the, the world is, is more good, better, um, for having imperfectly good beings such as ourselves in it. I think Augustine's view is that, uh, well, look, um, actually, recall in book one that we said that some of the so-called evil really isn't evil, it's divine retribution. And uh, you know, rest assured, God justly punishes all wrongdoing. We said that, that that just punishment isn't really evil. That's actually a good thing. It's justice, retribution, just retribution. It's a good thing. Okay. So here's the thing. Uh, no matter how much human wrongdoing there is in the world, it's always exactly balanced by uh, a, a, a compensating retributive good. So what I'm getting at is that there, there might have been several different worlds possible in which there's wrongdoing on the part of human beings. And in some of these worlds, there's more wrongdoing than in, than in others, right? But in the worlds in which there's more wrongdoing, there's also more of a good thing, divine retribution. And so <laughs> on balance, right, um, it all evens out. Uh, the, the, the amount of wrongdoing on the part of human beings in this world uh, doesn't make it a worse world than any other possible world in which there um, would have been human wrongdoing, less or, or more. It's kind of, it's, if you will, it's like it's a wash. <clears throat> this world might be worse than others insofar as it has like more human wrongdoing, but it's better than those others insofar as it has more divine retribution. Okay. 
that brings us to um to book to book three and 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 it's book three uh that ends up in in the western philosophical western philosophical tradition causing like a like a lot of problems um book three uh I take it as revisiting um, the holiness problem, which which was like partly addressed back in book one. So, like, Avodius at the beginning of, of, of book three, um, he realizes, or he now focuses on the fact um, that that God in this scheme like isn't just like um, a distant cause of um, human wrongdoing. God, in this scheme of Augustine's, um, makes, of course, like the wrongdoers, but 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 also um, knows in advance of all the wrong that they're going to do, and and and, and of course, like like has has the power to stop it. But but he he really he really focuses in on the fact that God is not just in in some sense like, like the cause um, of what happens because because being because because the cause of the wrong the wrongdoer's existence um, but also has foreknowledge of of what the wrongdoer will do and it's this foreknowledge um, that that. That uh, Avodius thinks makes it look a lot like, yeah, God's a wrongdoer. Okay. So um, this this uh, uh, raises a, a, another problem um, having to do with the Christian God that I think goes by the name commonly of the foreknowledge problem. And uh, I have a, a, a detailed, explicit presentation of this problem again in argument form in the slides presentation that accompanies, um, um, that, that, is, that is to be found among this week's materials. So uh, the, the argument basically goes like this. And so here's the problem in argument form. Okay. Uh, necessarily, uh, if anyone knows that something will occur, whatever it is, call it X, then X will occur. Okay. Uh, necessarily must be the case that if someone knows X is going to happen, X will happen. Okay. Uh, God knows, let's say, that uh, tomorrow you're going to uh, tell a lie. And like maybe like a serious one, like not a wide lie. So you can't make it out to be a good thing. No, it's, it's actually really bad. Uh, God, God knows this. Okay. Conclusion Necessarily, then, you're going to, to do this act. Necessarily, you're going to tell this okay, kind of serious lie. Necessarily, you're going to do um, wrong. You are, in still other words, forced to do so. Okay, and and who or what, if anything, like forces you to do this? Well, ultimately, it's got to be God. And so surely, like, if God is forcing you to do wrong, then, then God is himself, herself, God's self, a wrongdoer. So we have the holiness problem. So um, Augustine does not enter into a detailed criticism of, of um, the problem in argument form. Okay. There, there actually is... Um, um, what's called a logical fallacy in that argument that I that I present uh, in in the slideshow. A, a logical fallacy is an error in reasoning, okay. and 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 because the so there's a logical leap being made um, because the uh, the the argument right involves this logical fallacy. Uh, my view is that this problem, the so-called foreknowledge problem, uh, is actually like a fake problem. It's actually a pseudo problem. Um, uh, Augustine. Um, uh, Himself, though he doesn't, he doesn't go into the, like the nuts and bolts of how this argument works, and, and, and thereby like take it apart and show that this is not really a problem. 
Um, instead, um, he, he, he focuses on the conclusion. And the, the conclusion of the argument is that, right, necessarily, you will do wrong. And he understands that as the claim that, like, you're forced to do wrong, you're made to do wrong. You're, something makes, makes it happen that you do wrong, right? You're forced, you're coerced. Okay. He says, look, um, this, this argument has to be a bad argument. Because that conclusion is nonsense. The conclusion is an absurdity. And the word absurd actually means like apart from sense. Right? Uh, what have we already said wrongdoing is? Well, it's, it's acting from inordinate desire, right? And disorderly desire. So desire irrespective of reason. Um, but we've also said that it's doing that willingly, okay? It's, it's doing that like voluntarily. Well, it, it makes no sense to say that someone is coerced into doing something voluntarily. Um, uh, coercion <laughs> excludes voluntary action. Okay? We don't say that people do something voluntarily when they are forced do it. And that's really, um, I mean, that, that's really where things, where things should end, uh, I think. But he, he, then, he then goes a step further. And he, he makes the claim that uh, actually it, it makes no sense to say that anyone, including God, forces you to do wrong. Because it, ma it makes no sense to say that, that anything at all makes you do something when you, um, uh, when you do something voluntarily, when you exercise free will. Another way of putting it, nothing causes you to will as you do. Uh, so the, the cause is what is, is understood here, like to, to make something else happen. The, the cause is that from which certain other events might necessarily follow. And what Augustine is saying is where, where voluntary action is concerned, the things you do freely, there's no cause. Uh, what makes these actions happen? We can also put it this way, nothing. Nothing. Well, an action is something. It's a something. <laughs> it may not be an entity, but it, actions exist. They are. They're beings of a sort. So kind of what he's saying here is that um, uh, like, uh, the exercise of free will is like, it's like creatio ex nihilo, I, th I think is the right Latin. It's like creation from nothing. Like, like human beings, in having been given free will, have been given something like a, like a godlike power, right, to, to initiate um, uh, from uh, a, a sort of like ultimate beginning. That probably doesn't make sense because ultimate means last, but like, like hopefully you can see what I mean. Like, like humans like initiate by willing. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, what can I say? Anyway, it's as though humans have initiated an event. Before it, what occurred that like made it happen? Uh, this, this gives rise to, to, I think, what's sometimes known as the free will problem. Uh, the free will problem is a problem having to do with the, the question of whether we have free will um, in that rather, actually, think about it, strange sense. Okay? Um, 
and I mean it's a strange sense because ordinarily when we when we ask uh, whether someone did something of their own free will, um, like we're, we're 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 not asking whether like it was uncaused. Um, like we're we're we're, we're, a, we're asking something else. We're like asking like well you know like were were you coerced? Did somebody have a gun to your head? Something like that. Um, we're 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 not asking. Oh, did did you make that happen ex nihilo? Right? Were you exercising a godlike power to bring into being things from nothing? Um, yeah. But <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, this gives rise to that that famous problem, I think, the, the free will problem. And I'll talk about that problem more um, when we get to to, uh, to to Descartes, who um, wants to basically solve it. One of many philosophers who tried to solve this problem. So. So um, this this uh, leaves book three then um, af after Augustine has has dealt with the foreknowledge problem with with two last um, issues and uh, one issue has to do with um, this view that evil suffered is just divine retribution I think I said last time that, that Augustine realizes that. that he was a little bit too quick in book one to just dismiss all that evil people suffered as not really evil. That's one, that's one remaining issue that book three deals with. And the other issue that book three deals with, um, I think, has to do with like why it is um, that, that people do wrong. I think, I think uh, Augustine realizes that His, his solution to the problems of evil kind of like raised this question. Um, like, why is it that people ever misuse their will? The will has a, will has a certain purpose, and, and the purpose is to give rise to this great good thing, which is morally good action. Um, why is it that people would ever um, uh, sort of frustrate the purpose for which free will was given to us. What's going on there? So um, first, first of these remaining issues, um, like evil suffered, is it all in fact uh, divine retribution for wrongdoing? And Augustine at, at this point, he, he admits that no, it's, it's, not, it's not all of it. Um, divine retribution for the wrongdoing of the individuals who suffer. There, there are some exceptions. Uh, one exception that he notes, interestingly, is uh, the suffering of non-human animals. So some of like that, things on that level of like a non-rational life. So uh, uh, whenever I uh, like consider this kind of this kind of um, evil, and, and Augustine does regard it as an evil, um, I, I think of like uh, the, the animals that are trapped. In forest fires, and who um, are killed. Uh, so, like the, the the forest fires that have been ravaging the West Coast, like including including like very very recently, like Oregon. Um, some of these animals uh, surely do not do not get a quick death. Um, rather, what happens instead is that they're they're badly burned, and then um, linger. Uh, in that state for days and days uh, until finally, after a great deal of excruciating agony, they die. That sure seems like an evil. <laughs> and and it, it, it cannot plausibly be made out to be uh, God's just retribution for the wrongdoing of, uh, of, of, of the animal, let's say, like a, like a deer, okay? Um, like, like deer don't have, have reason, so they, 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 they can't act on desires contrary to reason, um, uh, like, like willfully. And I think Augustine would also say that it doesn't, it doesn't even make sense to say that like deer have like, like, like free will. I mean, uh, free will is like a is, it's it's a basis for like moral responsibility. Uh, we only uh, praise and blame beings that have like 
uh, moral responsibility. We don't praise and blame deer for anything they do, and this is a sign that we don't think that they have will, uh, free will anyway. So here's an evil that doesn't seem to be really good because it's divine retribution for the wrongdoing of the agent who suffers it. And there's another example. Um, so uh, when many people think that uh, in the distant past, you know, uh, you couldn't reasonably expect to live past like um, uh, 30 <laughs> or, or like or like 35, like that was it, right? At that point, you were probably like a granddad or a great granddad or a grandma or a great grandma and uh, you're going in the ground. Um, that is not so. Uh, actually, um, uh, I think average life expectancy was very low in the ancient world, even the ancient Western world uh, compared to what it is now. But that, but that was largely due to very, very, very high uh, infant and early childhood mortality rates. Um, there's actually a, a very famous uh, book, it still exists, it's called The Handbook of Epictetus. It's, a, it's sort of a, a handbook of Stoicism in which uh, the philosopher, Stoic philosopher Epictetus, sort of gives people advice on how to live their lives. And uh, one of the pieces of advice, well, advice that he gives, and this is someone writing in the, uh, well, this is someone talking in the uh, uh, first and second century uh, AD. Uh, one of his pieces of advice is that uh, if you're a parent, uh, when, you, when you embrace your child, Suppose like little girl, you should say, um, whisper to yourself anyway. So like, say it, say it in your inner voice. Um, Tomorrow, either you or I may die. <laughs> and and uh, I've, I've read uh, like commentaries on on Epictetus, or like a, the, the, uh, the contemporary scholar writing about the handbook and this part of it has it just expresses like horror. Like, oh. <laughs> What an awful thing, right, to think when you go and embrace your child. Well, the thing is, it was true. Um, uh, yeah, uh, especially uh, for the child. Right? So, um, like the years from about like you know zero to to um, seven or so, I think were like fraught with danger. Uh, uh, children um, quite often died, and and indeed. Um, uh, the, the last of the really famous Stoics is a man named Marcus Aurelius, who was Roman emperor. I, I think he had, he and his wife had something like, I think they had something like 12 children. And I believe only three of them lived to be um, adults. And so he had access to the very best uh, so-called physicians in the world. In fact, the famous uh, ancient physician Galen, I think, was working for him. Nothing could be done to save um, these children. So uh, when Augustine is thinking about evil suffered, uh, he isn't just thinking about the suffering of non-human animals. He's also thinking about the suffering and death of children. And no, he does not think that, that they are wrongdoers who deserve it. That's, of course, preposterous because, among other things, they haven't yet you know, achieved the age of reason. Um, so he's got some explaining to do, right? How, how God does, in fact bring about this suffering? How could God be good and be the agent of, of, that, of that suffering? So uh, with regard to animals, here's what he says. You, know, just, you be the judge, okay? Um, look, the suffering of animals is actually a good thing. It's actually a good thing because it's instructive to human beings. Animals uh, suffering, they, they, they strive to um, uh, live. They, they seek to survive. They struggle hard to survive. And this shows us human beings that they are not um, an accident. They're not a happenstance. Animals did not occur randomly. Um, stuff that occurs randomly does not have purposes. Uh, just does not have purpose that it tries to 
or struggles to achieve. Okay. Um, in other words, what he's getting at is that like the, the struggle of animal suffering just to survive gives us evidence that there has been an intelligence at work in creating this world. Okay. And so, and so ba basically it argues for complex, intelligent design. Okay. And so uh, the suffering of animals is, uh, oddly enough, supposed to be a sign that animals and the whole rest of the world have been created by the God of Christianity, who is one and goodness itself. As for the suffering of, of children and infants, the suffering of death, Augustine says the following, well, perhaps it is not the case that this is a just retribution for the wrongdoing of children. In, indeed, it is not the case. It is just retribution for the wrongdoing of the children. Uh, that does not exclude the possibility, though, that it is just retribution for wrongdoing. Not the wrongdoing of the children. No, they haven't done anything wrong. Parents. Parents. Right? They're surely sinners. They've surely done some things wrong. And so like the, the suffering that the children experience, suffering and death, that actually is a good thing. It's not a genuine evil. It's divine retribution directed at the parents for the wrongs that they have done. So, so God is punishing the parents through the suffering and death of their children. I believe this is Augustine's position. And again, to be the judge. Um, okay, like, finally, this other question, like, like why is it that people, um, why is it that people do wrong at all, if the will has this great purpose? Um, I mean, Augustine has already said, like, way back in book one, that, uh, things built to do a certain job tend to do that job, right, uh, unless they become, uh, corrupt for some reason. Um, the job of the free will is to, um, bring about right, this great good in the world, right, like voluntary righteous action. So uh, how do we, how is it that we like ever do wrong? And uh, Augustine, um, he, he has to reject uh, what I think is like the, the, the Greek answer uh, to this question. Uh, so I say it's the Greek answer because I think it's an answer which was fairly common among, among the Greek philosophers. Plato and Socrates and Aristotle too, and I, I, I think the Greek answer is that um, uh, people who do wrong do wrong out of ignorance. Uh, they do wrong because they they do not know what's good. Um, they they might have, as Plato put it, right, um, like true opinions about what's good, but those aren't very stable, right? That's, that's not like knowing the form of justice. If you know what justice is, particularly like, the, like justice in the individual, right? Like surely like you would never do, you would never do wrong, okay? So, so injustice, wrongdoing in general, for the, for the Greeks, I think, um, it's, it's an expression of ignorance. It, fall, it follows from like lack of knowledge. Um, the, the wrongdoers, like they don't really know what they're doing. This does not, this view does not rule out punishment uh, because punishment might have like an instructive function. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and for, for other reasons too, I mean, it might, it might help to like hold society together, uh, like punish um, wrong acts, even if they're done um, like, like out of, out of ignorance of certain crimes. Um, uh, Augustine is a Christian though trying to solve the problems of evil, he, he cannot go down that path. He, he, is, he cannot say that uh, human wrongdoing generally is done out of ignorance. It can't be a lack of knowledge. Um, and, and that's because 
uh, doing something out of ignorance is um, like it's it's uh, exculpatory. Like like ordinarily doing something out of ignorance uh, takes away takes away blame. Right? Um, people in Augustine's scheme have to be to blame for the wrongdoing that they do. Otherwise, all that evil that Augustine reads as God's divine retribution, it's not just, right? Like, if, if, if people are not really to blame for the wrongdoing that they do, then it's, then it's not just to punish them for the wrongdoing. Much of what we call evil, according to Augustine, is actually just divine retribution for human wrongdoing. Well, in that case, if the wrongdoing is done out of ignorance, the wrongdoers aren't to be blamed for it. If they're not to be blamed for it, then it doesn't make sense, and certainly not just, um, to punish them for it. Unless um, they themselves are somehow like responsible for, for being in a state of ignorance. Uh, so, uh, let me give you an example. We punish people and think it is just to do so, who driving drunk cause property damage to others or end up injuring others or who take the lives of others. But, but doesn't the drunk person do injury to others out of ignorance. They did not see them because they were driving while blind drunk. Yes, they act out of ignorance, but uh, we think that state of ignorance is a state that they put themselves in um, voluntarily. So it's as though uh, the, the ignorance that led to the action was ignorance that they voluntarily chose to be in. So because the ignorance was voluntary, um, we hold them to blame for the action that they did out of ignorance. Okay, here's what Augustine then wants to say. Um, if human beings, right? only did wrong out of ignorance, then that would be exculpatory and God's uh, uh, retribution <laughs> would not be just. But as a matter of fact, uh, ignorance in this case is no excuse. Uh, ignorance in this case is no excuse for two reasons. One is that um, actually since, since Jesus and the spread of the gospel, uh, everyone is in a position to understand um, that there is a God and what, what the law is. Um, and so no one is in a position to uh, plead ignorance anymore. Like if they are ignorant, they shouldn't be. <laughs> uh, they, they should have done things like like voluntarily in order to like to, to gain knowledge. Secondly, um, if human beings had to have the appearance on earth of the Son of God, the creation and spread of the gospel, in order to like like uh, like know God again, and, and know what God requires, know what the eternal law is, respect it. If they had to have all that happen, that's only because they 
They had done things to put themselves in a state of ignorance about all these matters to begin with. What's Augustine talking about? Well, he, he's, he's talking about, well, uh, I believe, like the fall. Uh, the fall of, of humanity and the casting out of humanity uh, from um, the Garden of Eden. Of Eden. So, so what he's saying here is that um, human wrongdoing, even if it's done out of ignorance, um, is, is inexcusable because we should not be in a state of ignorance, one, uh, now that the, you know, the good news has arrived. And two, right, if we were ever in ignorance, it was our own doing. Uh, we are in ignorance because we chose our ancestors, Adam and Eve, to separate ourselves from God by 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 disobeying right God's rule, God's order. Right uh, in the garden, supposedly, right there was basically like one rule: you can do anything you want, but that tree you cannot eat of it. And 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 uh, Eve and Adam, Adam and Eve, right? They violated that rule. That resulted from that resulted in a kind of like separation from God. Separate from God, human beings became ignorant of God. Did things that are wrong, continue to do things that are wrong, but that is not exculpatory, um, because this ignorance, this ignorance that we voluntarily brought on ourselves. Okay, now, like. Last thing, and I may I may have to I may have to review some of this um, on Thursday. Uh, that's a lot, but uh, last thing. So uh, that first evil, the first wrongdoing that occurs in the Garden of Eden, supposedly, that results in human beings being in a state of ignorance, which we have like voluntarily brought upon ourselves. Why, according to that, why, why, according to Augustine, does that evil occur? Why does that evil occur? It can't be ignorance. It can't be. I mean, a, after all, in, 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 in Genesis, I believe that we're told that, that uh, like Adam and Eve know who their creator is. They know God. We're told that they that they see God walking through the garden like every evening. God speaks to them, um, and uh, there's only one rule, and it's a very simple rule, and everyone understands the rule. Um, it can't be, it can't be ultimately ignorance that explains right, evil. Like, well, like, what is it? And, and, I, and I suspect Augustine's answer is this. It's, it's not a failure of reason. It's, it's, it's not a failure to like, like understand how things really are. It's, it's not a failure to like, like know the truth. Um, it's instead a matter of, of will. Um, I think his view is that uh, beings of free will are free to have um, bad will. They're free to be malevolent. Um, and so it's, it's perfectly possible for human beings to, to know quite well what the right thing to do is. To know quite well that this, the action they're thinking of performing, wrong. It is, it, indeed, it is like evil. And human beings also have the power, nonetheless, to choose evil anyway. Right. Um, perhaps for the sake of, I don't know, power. Uh, which, which, if you read like Genesis 1-2, like that, that, 
does seem to be uh, a consideration <laughs> um, 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 in view of which right, Adam and Eve choose to eat of that tree. So um, last thing here then, as I read Augustine, um, what he what he wants to say about like why human beings why human beings do evil uh, ends up being like quite different than what previous philosophers um, among the Greeks and the Romans wanted to say about wrongdoing. Uh, whereas those previous philosophers seem to have mostly thought that like wrongdoing is a matter of like acting from ignorance, it's a matter of acting from like, lack of knowledge. Augustine wants to say that. While that is while that is sometimes true, people people do act out of ignorance. The ignorance is itself culpable. <laughs> it's 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 something for which people should be blamed and faulted. And 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 ultimately, then, uh, wrongdoing is not based upon it. It is ultimately based upon. Um, malevolence. Um, it, it, it ultimately stems from um, like bad, bad will, um, per, perhaps with an eye towards um, like, like acquiring like more power uh, than is due to human beings. Anyway, anyway, uh, <laughs> I think I think that uh, is, an, is enough for now. Um, and so next time.